my hair I <laughs> that's what happens when you wear headphones all right howdy everybody oh I was almost late I was working on that book the new book and lost track of time so I grabbed my computer and just jumped over here <laughs> all right so let me tell you guys what's happening Gigs are starting to come in again. I guess that's a good thing. I've kind of liked sitting back and not doing all that stuff right now, you know? Not nice not having the money, right? But, um, yeah, you know, this time off has really made me question what I want to do and that's the you know it's like I just graduated from from high school or something you know we had all this time down and I wanted to you know use this I don't know maybe just to go in a different direction or something but it looks like right now I have no choice but to just take the gigs but I, you know, that doesn't mean that I'm stuck going in that direction. You know, I think what happened is this time off really gave me time to think about what I'm doing. For example, this next gig that I've got, and I'm not I'm not bad mouthing it. If I if I was bad mouthing it, I wouldn't be doing it, right? But this next gig I got is a loud gig. It's loud. And I've never liked loud gigs. In fact, my attitude towards loud gigs has been a source of contention. Hello, Anthony. Yes, I'm doing good. I hope you're doing well. Um, my attitude towards loud gigs has been a source of contention between me and the leaders for a long time. I remember the one guy saying that... Uh, this is just the way it is. He says, I'm the one with the problem. Everybody else wants it to be loud. Um, and yeah, you know, when you're legally deaf, that's funny though, right? I'm legally deaf, and a lot of these guys are worse than I am. And you know, the, the guy that I'm talking about that that made such a big deal out of me not liking to play in loud gigs. Um, he's got serious, serious hearing problems now. <laughs> huh? 30 years later, he's... That was 30 years ago when he said all that stuff to me. He probably doesn't remember it. But... Um, yeah, none of those guys can hear anything. They're, they're a lot worse than I am now. And, yeah. And for me, it's not about, hey, hello, unnamed user. <laughs> um, it's not to me, it doesn't, it's not so much about hurting your ears. And that's part of it, definitely, but I can... Wear protection, and it won't hear my hurt my ears. Those other guys, you know, I don't think they wear protection, obviously. But to me, it's about, you know, you work on a product. Let's say it wasn't music, right? Let's say you sell um, gold jewelry. You sell gold jewelry, and you invest... Uh, your whole life into learning how to be a jeweler. And you're good at it. And you've got someone coming along as a, as a customer. And they're buying up a bunch of your jewelry and taking it to the shop and melting it. That's what it's like. That's what it's like. To, to play, because when you play that loud on the trumpet, the quality suffers. I don't care who you are. 
the quality suffers. You're going to play out a tune. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Mary says it's a good analogy. Um, you're going to play out a tune. You're going to play with a bad sound. Uh, your flexibility goes out the window. There's no more flexibility, right? Um, style is gone. And, and let's look at why style is gone, right? If, if you're playing as loud as you can, what makes, a, what makes style is when you shape the note. And when you shape the note, you're shaping it in terms of when is it louder, when, it is, when is the note softer, and stuff like that. Um, if you're playing as loud as you can, there is no style. It's not possible to play with style at that volume. So I don't understand what you mean, Anthony, Louis Armstrong, too. What, do you mean um, playing loud? I don't know that he played all that loud. You can't imagine how loud I've had to play in my career. I don't think you guys can even imagine it. I had a student the other day that apparently they, they were calling me. I don't remember how I ended up. I don't normally tell my students what my health issues are. <laughs> but there was a gig that I played not long ago, I guess about a year and a half ago, where it was so loud, I could feel the, like, the, well, they had cowbell going. It was a, it was a Colombian music gig. He played, played loud. <laughs> Your record player was turned. Anthony says he played loud. No, I don't think so. My record player was turned up loud. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just amazing how loud some of these gigs can get. And I was on this Colombian, Colombian cumbia gig, and that was a weird gig. I'll tell you guys about that. Because I had gone like over a decade without playing cumbias. And when I did play cumbias, we only played a few Colombian things. Uh, the rest of it was more like Mexican cumbias, right? So I was excited, but I was also a little worried that maybe my sight reading, right, might not be up to, you know, if you don't play a certain style for a long time, you can lose it. Well, at least that's what I thought. But I went in there, and it was like flipping a switch, and I was back to it again, even with the loud stuff. But I really think I walked away from that and that the this music was so loud that it was affecting, like, my heart and stuff. Um, we're talking, I, the, way I, the way I say it to people, I call it rock concert loud. That's how loud it is, rock concert loud. And I only know how loud a rock concert is because um, I took a, 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 a we had a, a, a neighbor who had a, a disadvantaged son and his favorite band was, was um, ACDC. That's not a band I would ever go. And, and it's like everyone in the community would take turns taking this guy. Um, and it was my turn, and I took him to ACDC. Woo! Not ACDC. What's the one with? Oh, Kiss. I'm sorry, not ACDC. Kiss. Ugh. Anyway, some of Louis Armstrong's recordings are so old, they sound kind of thin. I grew up listening. Yes, you know, all that... Um, Tinny, sound a kind of tinny, he says. This is from Anthony. Yeah, um, that's because the technology back then was different. Back in those days, when he first started recording, like with the Hot Fives and the Hot Sevens, uh, is that what you're talking about, that music? When he recorded with the Hot Fives and the Hot Sevens, they, they would only use one microphone for the whole band. And balance, balance was made by putting some players closer to the mic and other players farther away from the mic. 
That's how they got balance. Hello, Gabriel. How are you? I love the hot fives and hot sevens. Um, you know, that's the thing about the way I am about enjoying music. You know, I told somebody the other day, um, he was talking about how going to a restaurant, he says he's finally got the whole restaurant thing down because he's been watching these restaurant, these cooking shows on, on, on cable. And he says, he says, I finally know how to go to a restaurant. And, and I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, um, I know how to tell them exactly what's wrong with all this stuff. And I'm like, why would you go through life like that? Why would you go through life looking for all the stuff that's wrong? And I feel the same way with music. You know, I would if I go to a restaurant, I'm not looking for the stuff that I don't like. I'm looking to enjoy the stuff that they have that I will like. If it's something I don't like, I'm not going to have a, a fit and report it on, on you know, give them a, a bad review or anything like that. I think that's silly. You, if and if you're always looking for the bad stuff, you're going to find it. And you're going to have a miserable life. If you're always looking for the good stuff, you're going to find it. And you're going to have a, a wonderful life, right? I know that's very simplistic. But it works with music, too. So when I listen to Hot Fives, I listen and, and I hear stuff I like. And... Um, same thing with Maynard Ferguson, right? I listen to Maynard Ferguson and I hear stuff I like. I and, and there's very few people. Here's where I don't. There are times when I say I don't like that music. And that's going to be when I don't like the message. So if you're going to tell me in your music that we're going to kill cops and stuff like that. Well, no, I don't like your music. I don't care how good it is. I still don't like it. <laughs> right? You know? So if your message is evil, then I don't want to have any part of it. But aside from that, when I hear music, I try to hear stuff that I like. I try to... Instead of picking through and finding things that displease me, I pick through and, and try to find stuff that I enjoy. And I do that with all the music, really. Right? <laughs> Anthony says, Gabriel, you should be proud of your name. The first trumpet player in heaven is Gabriel. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that's one of my philosophies. I think you should look for the things that you like and, and the stuff that you don't like. You know, you can get, just like that person who said that, you can get good at finding stuff you don't like. You can get really, really good at that. There's no limit. So, um... <laughs> Anthony says so Gabriel says that's true he's an archangel playing trumpet and Anthony says I think Satan plays the euphonium <laughs> oh my uh, you guys are funny so um, anyway we haven't had any questions yet anybody have any I've just been rambling Anybody have any questions? So, yeah, this book project, it's a big deal. I've never done anything this big before. We have a book coming out, and, you know, I've done, um, I've done books before, dozens of books, so that's not a big deal. And I've done albums before, that's not a big deal. But we're doing a book in coordination with um, two albums. And we're trying to release them at the same time. So that's what I've been spending all my time doing lately. 
Gabriel says, Eddie, I have a question on where to put my fingers. Okay, what's your question? Anthony says, your phonium is a weird instrument because it faces up. <laughs> you know, they have... I've seen trumpets from like 150 years ago that actually face up like that. And then they got smart, huh? Anyway, what's your question? All right, you're probably typing, okay. I'll wait. I'm very excited about this book. But right now it's making me tired. That's why I'm here, you know? Um, I'm going like one thing to the next to the next and I just didn't think to look at my hair um, on the piston trumpet do you always leave the thumbs on them so <clears throat> I put my thumb here I don't know if that's what you're talking about on um, and Yeah, so I, I put my, there's there's two places to put your thumb. This is my way up here. The, the most common place that everyone teaches is here between the two valves. And um, that said, when, when I made the adjustment to this position, there were times when I would let both, and in fact, I think I still do this sometimes. I'll let, I'll play like this sometimes. <laughs> and I had to do that because when I switched my position, I was so used to, oh, you play that way. You play with your hands, your fingers floating. I think that's great. I think that's great. I don't think it's an issue. I, so I actually think that's a good thing. There's a lot of... You, here's the thing. When your fingers are floating like that, you have the capacity to play faster than everybody else. Part of the reason I put my finger, my, my thumb here and let, let the pinky float over the top is because it does increase my speed playing the horn. So that's, I think it's great. I, I wouldn't change anything. Okay, well that makes sense. I haven't played much of the rotary trumpet but it makes sense that you have the thumb on because, if I'm not mistaken, you're kind of sort of holding the horn there, aren't you? Isn't some of the weight on your thumb? I, I've never played a rotary trumpet. I did get to play an old keyed trumpet a few years ago. That was a, a great experience. I wouldn't mind buying one of those, but... You know, I'm, I don't do much classical playing as I used to now. I would love to, um, but it's, you know, you go where the market goes. I have the skills for it, but I, no, I don't do nearly as much classical. Now, that's not to say that the rotary is a classical horn. I'm not saying that. Anthony asks, is it true if you play with your knuckles, or rather your fingers, not on the top of the pistons, you can throw your valves out of balance? Yes, I believe that. And here's why. Because, let's go this way. Um, now, okay, let's put it this way. If you do this, it's not a 100% guarantee that you're going to do that, okay? The, the, the key word here is can throw 
not will throw, but it's it's possible to squeeze the valves down, and if you're squeezing the valves down, you're pushing them at a, at a, a, a false angle instead of straight up and down. Okay? And I, I don't know that I like the, the, the words out of balance. What it is is it's instead of having, let's say this is the valve. Instead of pushing the valve straight down, if you come out at an angle like that, you're wearing unevenly on the valve. You're wearing here unevenly, and you're wearing here unevenly because the, the valve is being pushed sideways inside the casing. And after a while, if you do that too long, um, it'll be loose inside the valve casing. So, yes, that's a big deal. Um, now, that said, the trumpet is not like a violin, right? A violin, the more you play it, the better it gets, okay? Trumpet, the more you play it, the more it disintegrates. And all trumpets have a lifetime. And that lifetime can be... Uh, the lifetime is connected to how often you use those valves. So someone who plays real fast or like me, right? And I'm not saying I play real fast. I'm just saying when I do my scales, you know, I'm, I, I do scales and scales and scales. How, how many... Th tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of scales have I done on this trumpet since 1997. You know, so the vowels are constantly going, constantly going, constantly going. So I don't want to give the impression that playing it this way opposed to this way, I'm not saying that playing this way will make the, the horn not get worn. The horn gets worn no matter what. I think the idea is if you if you play this way, it gets worn faster. And you have a shorter lifetime on this trumpet. Okay? Anthony says, I get what you're saying. Thank you. Because I see lots of jazz trumpet players with their hands over the pistons. Sure, that happens a lot. And all that means is that they're getting less out of the horn. That's, that's what that means. The, the, the horn won't last that long. Because they are... And along the way, they'll probably have some problems with the valves going down sideways. So I hope that makes sense. But yeah, I don't think it's going to... Um, it's not so severe that the horn doesn't work anymore like just after a few plays or anything like that. All right. I didn't advertise this today. So you guys are the ones that um, already know. So Gabriel says, can I ask once more, please? Once more, what? Yes, of course, you can ask as many questions as you want. Um, I don't know if you guys can see how many people are here, but we're kind of low today. Um, so you guys can ask as many questions as you want. That's what we're here for. <laughs> Anthony says, you're related to first trumpet in heaven. You can ask questions all day.
So, Anthony, we're going to have to meet sometime. My next gig is not far from where you're at. I'm trying to do Artunian Concerto, and the beginning are all top notes. I can play them, but they are not resonant. How to fix it? Um, you know, when I hear that so resonant, what, what do I say to, to, so you're asking specifically how do you make the upper notes? Let me pull it out real quick. Oh. I've actually got a few different copies of it. I think I have an answer for you. I don't think the resonance is probably what it is you're thinking. <laughs> Comedy else says, sorry, it's classical, I know. I love classical music. You know what's funny? I'm known as a jazz player, and but I've been doing a lot of composition lately, and all of my composition, well, I, I shouldn't say all, most of my compositions are completely classical. I had a guy tell me one time that... My my compositions are not classical. Classical, he says they're quasi classical. That's why my first trumpet ensemble album was called Quasi Trumpet Master or something like that. I think it was tr Quasi Trumpet Master, and um, it was it was talking about that because it was mostly classical music on the album, and um, and it was that stuff that I wrote that. He says, well, that's not really classical music. That's not, that's not classical. Like that's, and that's a, about as um, offensive as, as the guys that say that's not really jazz, you know? So, hello, Javier, how are you doing? Um, so here's what I think would help you. And not that I've ever heard you. If you want, by the way, any of you guys that want to send recordings or videos of yourself for me to listen to so I can see. So I can only assume what you mean by making it more resonant. I hope that mean, I hope that makes sense. Um, if you tongue, and this is something that I'll remind you that I, that I learned from uh, Armando Guitala. If you tongue with that th tongue instead of a ta tongue, da 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 da, something more like that. Now it's been <laughs> years since I played this. Ooh. Right? If you if you use that tongue. Instead of the so that time I used the, the th tongue, da, 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 right? Instead of ta 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 ta, here's what the ta ta. And I don't know if you can hear that, hear the difference between those two. I'll try to the 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 computer mic. It might even be um, backing you know distorting right now. Uh, so I hope this makes sense. So here's here's with the th tongue. If you if you do that instead of I think you can get what sounds like a more resonant sound. I don't think when you're playing this stuff that it's that resonance is as much the issue as style is. I hope that makes sense. 
Ah, let's see. Anthony says, that reminds me, I always ask you about high note playing, but I realize my notes are not really high notes. Okay. Javier says, I love jazz, my favorite style of music, even though they say jazz is just an excuse to play wrong notes. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, all right. They are G, top of staff, or A, top of staff. I am playing in Sigmund Herring etudes. I love Sigmund Herring. I, did, I used to teach out of Sigmund Herring all the time. Hello, Fabian. Great to see you. So yes, Gabriel, if you if you use more of a TH, you might be getting you might it might help you get more of that sound that you're looking for. And I hope because when I play loud, this thing, the the microphone on this thing distorts. So I hope I didn't really just like clobber your ears. Um, so, you know, Javier, so Javier is asking, is it better to do the tonalization one key per week or per month? That depends on, on you. And I'm not real, we, even though we've, had interaction here. I'm not sure skill level where you are right now. Usually more like one per week. The time when I went to one per month was, I, I want to say the late 90s. And it was because I was going through this phase where I was digging deeper. I was trying to dig deeper into all the stuff I was doing, and it just made a lot of sense to me at the time to do a whole month on one key, right? And it actually does make a big difference. So, um, so Javier, you were saying the, about the wrong notes. You know, here's the thing about about music, right? And it's not genre. This has nothing to do with genre. It has to do with personalities. You know, I, I know I told you guys about this before, and I've had more time to think about it. I told you guys about it the week that it happened. There's somebody who apparently hit my guts in the UK somewhere, and... He left some messages on my, uh, some, some comments on my YouTube videos telling me how horrible of a player I was. And this is all based on the fact that when I played a long note as a demonstration. He checked it with his tuner and it was out of tune. Now, now keep in mind. There was no musical context. I wasn't playing a melody. I wasn't playing a scale. It was just one note. <laughs> and he says, I'm a terrible player. Good players play in tune. And everybody has their thing that they think is most important. And generally speaking, for example, um, jazz players are not as serious, and I know this is going to ruffle some feathers if people watch this later, um, jazz players are not nearly as serious about playing in tune as classical players are. That's just a fact of life. That's just a fact of life. I've been on both sides. Um, there is ensembles that will spend hours just tuning up chords in the middle of a song. Hours. And the jazz, I've never seen a jazz group ever do that. And so to a lot of, to a lot of um, classical people, playing in tune is one of those 
ultimate things. That's it's one of those. If it's out of tune, it's wrong. It's as bad as having a wrong note. And the jazz side of this is almost the opposite. You know, if if you so it's and it's not that one is good and one is bad and one's better and one is worse. It's it has more to do with personality. And so a lot of times this this freedom that we have as musicians, as jazz players, a lot a lot of classical people just can't even comprehend that. You know, when you look at my free improvisations, I have almost a hundred of them. Actually, more than a hundred if you include the ones I did in a studio. Uh, so over a hundred free improvs that I've done. And they're on my, you can look them up. And when I do those improvs, I'm not trying to do anything. I just sit and I play. I'm not trying to play chords. I'm not trying to do an idea. I'm not trying to impress people. I just sit and whatever pops up in my head, I just play it. Um, and there's times when I play, you can tell I'm playing a quote unquote wrong note because I'll go to that fingering and I'm playing the wrong harmonic or something, right? Um, but that's part of our freedom is we, we are even free to make mistakes. So this thing about um, jazz, and I know I'm talking a lot about this a lot, right? But this is really uh, jazz, where you say jazz is just an excuse to play the wrong notes. It really is. <laughs> and thank, thank, we're thankful for that. We can play as many wrong notes as we want. You know, that's one of the things that I teach. I have what I call, when I'm teaching jazz improv, I have what I call jazz, uh, uh, improv exercises. What is an improv exercise? So in order to know what an improv exercise is, you have to know what improv uh, improvisation is. In my opinion, when we're improvising, we shouldn't be trying to do anything. It should just be stuff that flows out. We shouldn't be trying to do anything. An improv exercise is when we do try to do something. We're improvising, but while we're improvising, we're trying to do this or we're trying to do that. One of the most popular improv exercises is called the eighth note exercise, where you, you practice, you put the track on and you improvise with the track and you just play eight notes only. So twice there I broke the rule, right? I did some triples coming down, and then I did a, a a quarter note in the middle of that, an anticipated quarter note. But that's that's an improv exercise. I'm to saying to myself, I'm going to try to only play eight notes, and that's one of the most um, popular uh, improv exercises that there is. But there's also one that I use for people. When they get when they're a little too uptight when they're improvising, I'll tell them to do the wrong note improv exercise. And what you basically do is try to make beautiful music by on purpose playing all the wrong notes. I can't do that here without a track. But you put a track on, you start improvising, and you on purpose play notes that are not in the scale, not in the chord, nothing, right? the most dissonant notes you can find, and you try to do that and present it as beautiful music. And that's, a lot of times, that improv exercise is eye-opening because it's not as easy as it sounds. And when you do that, when you do that, it's like there's, uh, it opens your mind to see, like, like, really, there's not that many notes you can play that sound bad. Really? Anyway, I'll move on. Sorry about that. Anthony says, T, 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 t or two for tonguing. Is that a question, Anthony? 
I think that depends on, and what I was telling Gabriel is that if it's T H E or T H A or T H, the, the, or the, right, is sometimes more stylistically appropriate. And by the way, the the T the ta too is for um, register, right? So for E would be for a higher note, U would be for a low note. Javier says, I put myself in beginner level in everything but range. Okay. So yes, one week would be great for that. I'm sorry, I'm like way behind on now catching up on all this because I went off. Um, that Coltrane thing did in some, some of his material is extraterrestrial, right? Well, you know what? That A lot of that stuff is that he's doing. What he's doing there is um, most of it's harmonic, but the way he's approaching it harmonically is so structured. It's, it's all got structure to it. And what you're hearing is that structure. That's why it sounds that way. So I'm not quite sure about this question, Gabriel. What's the minimum configuration in improv by four notes? I don't, what, what do you mean by that? If you can clarify that, I think I can answer that. I'm not sure. Anthony says, I reversed my practice to long tones some scales and articulation the music after 30 40 minutes then i finish with double tongue and some colon flexibility with high notes oh eight i see what you're saying gabriel so the eighth note exercise usually in jazz we look to a eighth note Pulse. Um, so, here's the thing. When we're talking about jazz, most of the time we're talking about swing. And with swing, that second note of the eighth note is out of rhythm, and it's a little stronger than the, uh, uh, the other note. <laughs> Okay, so that pattern, because of the swing, does not lend itself very well to <clears throat> 16th note related patterns the way classical music does. So <clears throat> outside of the eighth note, so when you look at eighth notes, eighth note triplets, quarter notes, chord note triplets, half notes, out in that realm, there's a lot that we can do. And then we also have these like, like um, glissandos, which is not actually swung. And those tend to be seven tuplets, five tuplets, nine tuplets. Um, but yes, the general pulse, I want to call it a pulse. The general pulse of, of, of jazz is going to be eighth note practicing, right? Eighth note. That's, it's not a rule that we have to do eight notes all the time, but that's like the the canvas that we paint on, so to speak. So, hello, Sparky. He says, and I... I I think you're talking to Anthony. He says, make sure you warm down. Um, personally, I don't warm down ever. With one exception, if I am damaged, I will warm down. Um, but I don't have a problem with other people warming down. Um, but I can see why you're saying that, because if you're, if you're ending the day with, with, 
lip slurs and high notes, I could see how you would want to do maybe some pedal tones after that to loosen everything up. I always follow my um I always follow my lip slurs with pedal tones. Because the lip slurs you know, work your lips out and you, you can get some stiffness in there. Pedal tones flush that all back out again. So, Gabriel says, I've never tried improvisation. Is there any book from you to begin in, with improvisation? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> um, let me tell you how I started improvising I started improvising before I knew what it was. I didn't do, I didn't do, um, I didn't sit down and say, let me start improvising. I used to just play stuff that came to my, to my ears. And you know what? There's a great exercise you can do is the first thing you hear in your head, you don't play that one. Wait till the second one comes up. And I, I don't know why that works so beautifully, but it does. So, um, now, here's the thing. If you don't have any ideas, if you don't know what to do, you can start, when you're improvising, you can start with just one note. Or maybe two notes, right? Sometimes two notes are better. And so you play your two notes. So most of my improv comes to me. It, it like shows up in my mind as a response to something I just played. I hope that makes sense. So if you just start with two notes, and if, if, if nothing else comes to your mind after those two notes, play the same two notes again. So Right after I played the, the A and the B flat, the second time I heard, the, in my mind, I heard the low A and the B flat. So I decided that's what I'm going to do. So while I was playing, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, I heard in my head, da -da -da -da, right? Okay, so Gabriel says, once I tried, it sounded very Mozart-like and not jazzy. Now I have to tell you guys about the tree, okay? I have to tell you about the tree. This is one of my new, I, I say new, it's about a year old. One of my new analogies. There's nothing wrong with your improv just because it sounds like Mozart. If you listen to my improvisations, a lot of them sound like stuff, maybe Mozart. Mine is a little bit too chromatic for Mozart, but it, it sounds maybe more like, a lot of mine sound like Bartok. Um, some might sound like Debussy. Um, you know, so no, I wouldn't have a problem. Now, let me tell you about the tree. And I came up with this as a response to the way other people teach jazz. Because they're starting to now teach jazz as a dogma, right? They're starting to teach jazz as a this is right and this is wrong, instead of teaching it as a form of personal expression. And that's a problem. Right? If you play jazz your way and people say, well, that wasn't right, you didn't hit the right notes and you didn't follow this rule and you didn't follow that rule, that's not jazz. And the history of jazz was full of people that didn't follow those rules. And in fact, someone who did follow those rules, those are the guys that sound kind of boring. <laughs> right? So, um, so I teach this thing about this tree. So let's say and I've been saying lately, peach tree and an apple orchard, right? So over here, we have you, who is the peach tree. 
And you go to a teacher and say, teach me how to play jazz. And the, 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 the jazz player hears, the jazz teacher hears you play and says, you don't sound like an apple. You don't sound anything like an apple tree. So he goes up to your tree. He, I usually use an ax. He cuts your tree down and sticks you in the dirt next to the apple trees. That's not going to go well. All that's going to do is kill the tree. We have to honor in our music education, especially in the more creative stuff, we have to honor who we are already. If we say, no, the way I play is wrong, it's terrible, I need to change it, it's just like chopping a tree down, which kills the tree, and trying to plant it someplace else without its roots. And I'll tell you what, even if you could get that peach tree to um, take roots in the, in the uh, uh, what do you call it, the apple orchard, that peach tree is still going to give you peaches. Right? <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the best part of that analogy is if you look at what, the, what nourishes that peach tree, it's manure, right? It's all the quote-unquote crap that we have to go through that makes that tree healthy. <laughs> I like that part of the analogy. But seriously, what you do in your improv now has value now. I'm going to say that one more time. What you do in your improvisation now has value now. And if it sounds like Mozart, hallelujah. Mozart was awesome. <laughs> right? <laughs> and if you want to sound more like jazz, then the key to doing that is to listening to more jazz. So the improv is what it is. You let it be what it is. Now, the, the thing is, okay, so I said you got to listen to more jazz. There are some of these things that you can use these improv exercises that I talk about. You can use some of those. Like the eight, the eighth note exercise is a great exercise for learning how to sound more like you play jazz. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. So, um, Anthony says, what you said before, trumpet's not getting better like violin. Would your trumpet have a longer life if you play a different trumpet every day? I own five, five trumpets. Yes, of course. Mathematically, you're going to make it last five times longer. I hope that makes sense. So, if you have five trumpets and you alternate between between them, of course it's going to last. make them last longer, as long as they're being cared for. Gabriel says, I was expecting the thing on listen more jazz. <laughs> you know, that's, that's crucial. I have an adult student who's, who, now I haven't flown so much this year because of COVID-19, but, um, now, when he first started with me, he wasn't flying so much. And he doesn't take his horn with him when he travels. He goes to India. He goes to Israel. He goes to Italy. And there's another one. I can't remember what. But he's got different places. He's, he's a software guy. And he, uh, he's got teams out there. And um, he says what he does on when he's traveling is he just listens to jazz the whole time. And when he comes here, even though he doesn't practice as much as he used to, he's making great, great progress. He's making wonderful progress. And I think it's because of how much listening he does. So you can look at 
listening as sort of a multiplier. Listening multiplies your practice. Listening multiplies the effectiveness of your practice. So Anthony says two of his instruments are student and three are professional horns. But I became a snob because of the professional horns. <laughs> oh, my. So, we're just about out of time if you guys have any other questions. I want to do a video about this, this these um, improv exercises. I've got a bunch of them now that I teach. And I don't think anybody should do all of them. That's not how this works. You do the improv exercise that that matches the problem you're having on your improv. So whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, you're welcome, Gabriel. So yeah, whatever it is you're trying to change in your improv, you, you do an exercise out of it. So, for example, one of the hardest improv exercises I've ever tried to do was one I call chord tone exercises. So if I'm playing the blues, I only use the, the, the chord tones from the blues. Oh, I just already messed up. <laughs> I'm playing in a hard key, but still. That's a, so every note that I play is supposed to be a chord tone, something from the harmony. And that's the hardest. Out of all the exercises I teach, that's the hardest one. No passing tones, right? So, yeah, that's, that's pretty hard, especially when the tempo gets high because it's not natural. Hello, Mr. Walker. You're welcome. Yes, so the, the book is uh, the day I have penciled in, and I'm, I'm afraid, not afraid, no, no, take, I take that work, word back. I'm not afraid. Um, I don't want to do what it says in James, the book of James. I don't want to say this is what I'm going to do because I'm going to do what I have to do, and then I'm going to put it all in God's hands. Um, that said, the date we're shooting for is November 21st. Um, hopefully, all of it will be released together on November 21st. There is a chance. I've been getting messages from the people I have to deal with for this stuff. There is a chance that it will be delayed because of COVID-19 and the factories are operating with half capacity and stuff like that. So that's that's um, that's an issue, right? But I'm putting, once it's out of my hands, I'm putting it in God's hands, and we're going to go with his timing, and that's how this book is going to work, okay? So, and, but, and thank you for being here, all of you guys, and thank you for your thank yous. <laughs> yeah, and have a great weekend. We'll see you guys next week. And, um... I'm going to get back to work. All right. Have a great weekend and we'll see you guys next time. God bless you. Bye.